agreement with the uh, previous comments, uh, but I'm going to try to take a slightly different stab uh, at this question, which is, I want you to sort of contemplate the following sentences. Uh, why no Joe Montana? Why no Joe DiMaggio? Why no Michael Jordan today? And then substitute in, why no Milton Friedman today? And I think when you think about these kind of characters and what they accomplish, you're stuck with two different things, uniqueness of the skill set in each of those individuals, and also the circumstances of time and place in which they interacted. And we cannot control the circumstances. The only thing that we can sort of uh, look at is the impact of various skill sets. And so Friedman is unique uh, because, uh, not because he's extremely smart, um, all elite economists are extremely smart. No one would say that Paul Krugman, for example, is uh, dumb. Uh, you know, there's this, been this uh, bet that was put out by Bob Murphy to try to get Krugman to debate him. And someone asked me to comment, and I said, Bob should be careful for what he wished for. Because if he got a chance to debate with Paul Krugman, I don't think it might not be so good, right? Uh, Krugman's a very smart guy. We just happen to disagree with him. That's not that he's dumb. Paul Samuelson was the smartest boy on the planet, which is why it is that he was able to pull off the revolution that he did, both at the undergraduate level and the graduate level. For people that have my preferences, if I would have loved it if Paul Samuelson wasn't so smart, right? Because then he wouldn't have been as successful at doing that. So the fact that Friedman is extremely smart, that just sort of goes with it. So what is it that, in addition to him being smart, that made him so uh, unique uh, in this sense, his unique set? And many people have touched on this, but using my sports analogy, I would refer to him as a four-tool superstar. Um, he's equally skilled at talking to his scientific peers. He was equally skilled at talking to students and communicating economics. And he was equally skilled at talking to policymakers, and then finally the general public. One of the things that's unique across all of that, Professor Peltzman mentioned his intellectual veracity and and curiosity and all that stuff. I was very fortunate. I was a Hoover National Fellow when I was uh, much younger than I am now, and Milton Friedman was in his 80s at the time. I have no idea how brilliant he must have been when he was much younger than that, but I'll tell you this much. In the entire year, he never lost a single debate. He was just you know, phenomenal. They, every day at the Hoover Commons meeting, you go there and have milk and cookies and coffee and cookies, and Friedman would, would debate with people. And he loved debate. He didn't like people that agreed with him. I blew my biggest chance ever to maybe impress Milton Friedman because he was having a debate on the drug war. And he turned to me and said, what do you think? And I said, the same as you. <laughs> he wasn't happy. Uh, <laughs> right? He actually wanted to you know, debate. And the other thing about Friedman that people should keep in mind is he's a total truth tracker. Uh, in the symposium that Dan put together in EJW, uh, I like all the, the writings in that symposium quite a lot, but I disagree tremendously with Jamie Galbraith's contribution in there. I'm not going to go into big depth about it, but I recommend everyone to read it and dislike it as much as I do. Uh, but one of the things that, that uh, while we were, I was out at Hoover with Friedman, there was a visitor from the, from the former Soviet Union former already by that time, and uh, they were talking about demographics and treatment of uh, women in the, in, uh, in the Soviet Union. It was an extremely unpleasant picture that they were drawing, and it would be in Friedman's interest, given his ideological priors, to simply go along with what was being said, and he refused because he doubted the demographics of what was involved. He said, no, no that doesn't make any sense. That couldn't be like that, and that was very impressive to me. I don't know how well that's translating out to you because he didn't let an argument slip by that would have been on his side because he thought it was a shoddy argument, not because you know it was it was on the side that he liked or not on the side. He cared about quality of argument, and I think that comes across. The other thing that comes across in Friedman is that Tyler might have said it was he wasn't getting annoyed or he was always warm and pleasant with people. I actually think one of the things that's really 
important about looking at Friedman is that he spoke, he recognized that a conversation requires two people. And he tried to, rather than he's speaking at somebody, he tried to engage with his uh, debate partner and try to, you know, accept as much on the terms of the debate that that person could have in order to, to sort of work within their system to make them come to his side. I think that's actually what he did in his, uh, I think Sam Peltzman was very astute and recognized that Friedman was one against the many, and he ended up by winning. When Back when I was in graduate school, it was the same time as Dan and, and uh, Tyler and, and uh, David was a young professor actually just being established and interviewing people that were going through graduate school at the time about a, things, a t-shirt that used to run around was a t-shirt of Milton Friedman and his little bald head and had, you know, the, uh, you know, MV equals PQ and it said, with this equation I have conquered, you know, like that. And there was two t-shirts, by the way, that went around Mason at that time. These guys were at different schools, but they have a Mason connection. But there was two t-shirts. One was the Friedman one. The other one was one by F.A. Hayek. And it said, picture of young Hayek, and it said, I wrote monetary theory in the trade cycle when I was 25. What have you done lately? Uh, so those were you know, pretty important ideas, I think, at the time. But Friedman, when you look at him, what he did was he stepped inside of the Keynesian system and then shifted the model in such a way that it actually reversed the conclusions of that. It's a tremendous act of intellectual jujitsu. And he, he did that with a smile on his face and a twinkle in his eye and all the rest of the stuff. So four tool superstar could talk to his peers, could talk to his students, could talk to the uh, policymakers, and talk to the general public. That's pretty amazing. Very few people have that skill set. So the question is, what do you do if you're in the business of the farm leagues of trying to train economists that are similar to uh, Milton Friedman? Uh, if you view that as a, as a skill set. And so I want to sort of just suggest a few of the things that, that we try to do as a program here. The first one is recruiting because it's really hard to win if you don't have talent. Okay, that's, you know, uh, if you're not, you know, smart, it's going to be really hard for you to compete in this game. It's a very competitive game. And so we need to go out there and recruit. Just to sort of put things in perspective at some level, when I came to George Mason after moving down from New York, I was put in charge of a grad student program, and I had, we had eight fellowships. That was it for all levels of graduate students. When Vernon Smith and the crowd came, part of the deal was is that we got four additional. So we had, had 12 from first year to the, the time of dissertation. This year alone, we have 96 students at the MA level and at the PhD level and our Adam Smith fellows that are getting some kind of support that we've been trying to bring in and develop a program. And when we do that, we identify talent, uh, and then what we try to do is expose them to developing a skill set so that they can try to exploit their four tool abilities. That is, our first priority is teaching them how to interact with their scientific peers. But then the second thing is developing great teachers of economics. Uh, and the third thing is exposing them to doing work uh, with policymakers. And then the fourth one is learning how to engage in the uh, general public communication of economic ideas. So it's training and opportunities is what we're sort of focused on doing here. Now think about the impact that modern technology has had on the dissemination at each of these levels. It's pretty amazing. And so one of the things that you know, we hope to do is be able to exploit the various different shifts in technology so that, in fact, you can develop and hone that skill set. So David and, and uh, uh, emphasized tremendously this weeding out function, and Sam Peltzman emphasized that as well. One of the unique things about George Mason, and I imagine that would also be unique at some other uh, schools, so it's not so unique, but, but schools that are a little bit off, or out, and David has a great article which is called How to Survive as a Slightly Out of Sync Economist. And I think that, you know, the students that work closely with me, for example, I would say how to survive as an out of sync economist, not slightly, uh, like extremely out of sync. Uh, and, uh, and how do you do that? We try to, you know, develop this four tool kind of approach. And by doing that, I think you can find a market niche in the world of economic communication and, the, and, and, and being skilled up in this modern technology. So while it's true 
that Milton Friedman was unique, we also go back to my sporting analogy. Joe Montana gives way to who? Peyton Manning and Tom Brady. And maybe before his knee injury, you know, RG3, sort of, or Kaepernick, or some other kind of quarterback, which is not really like Joe Montana, but is a sort of a new version. Uh, Joe DiMaggio, right? He gives way, now this is, represents my New York biases, gives way to Derek Jeter. I don't want anyone giving me any crap about Derek Jeter. Um, I have a Derek Jeter bobblehead, and when students come to see me, I used to make them have to honor the Jeter before they can talk to me. Uh, so he gives way to Derek Jeter. I didn't mention Alex Rodriguez, so a few years ago I might have said that, but that was a bad statement. <laughs> He's like Paul Krugman. Uh, so, and, and Michael Jordan gives way to LeBron James. They're different, they haven't yet accomplished all those things, but people do do it. So the question is, Milton Friedman gives way to what? And what I want to sort of suggest to young people that are interested in economics is to take advantage of the modern technologies and aspire to be great like Milton Friedman was. And that you shouldn't sort of just have a council of despair that Milton Friedman's are not possible in the future. There are lag times between greatness. To use sports again, just think about this. In tennis, Roy Emerson set the record for most grand slams in the 1960s. All right, it took all the way till Pete Sampras in the 2000s before that record was broken. All right, that's a 20 year period. Once Sampras broke his record, it took less than five years before Roger Federer broke his record. So you can have clusters of greatness or great absence of greatness for, for periods of time for a variety of reasons. To use tennis again, think about modern male tennis in the US. From 1970s to the, to the 2000s, tennis was dominated by male, by US males. All right? And many of you, you might remember because you're very young, uh, you know, Pete Sampras and Andre Agassi. All right? Older people will remember John McEnroe and Jimmy Connors. All right? And these kind of players. Right now, there's not a single American male in the top 10 players in the world. And it, there's no prospect of one actually appearing in the next several like, years. And so what's going to happen there, right, in terms of that? That happens, you know, gaps occur. And so it may be the case that one of the reasons why we don't see a Milton Friedman arising right now to respond to the situation of the financial crisis, which is why we're having this conversation in some sense, the Friedman, you know, wasn't there, is precisely because maybe this is just one of those gap times for market-oriented thinkers and that precisely because maybe of the success of uh, the shifts in the movement towards away from the Milton Friedman position, you're going to see a young person come up that's going to be a four tool or a five tool. Maybe now there's a five tool because you have to appear on YouTube or whatever, or whatever the future is going to be. And then that person actually is going to be the person that will shift public opinion in. So I want to sort of end by suggesting that I don't think that the circumstances are such that no Milton Friedman will ever come around in the future. I think talented people will have to exploit whatever the circumstances are that confront them, and that you'll see a Milton Friedman. But just like LeBron James doesn't do exactly the same things that Michael Jordan did, okay? He, did, he does aspire to sort of uh, greatness in that, in that sense. And I think we'll see economists who are able to talk to those four audiences uh, emerging, you know, quite significantly in in the future. So I want to encourage all the young people to do that. But thanks. Great. Thank you.